I want to preach to you today from the subject, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Father, bless us now as we preach the word of the Lord. May we preach it with sound doctrine and clarity. May we do no damage to your word, Lord. We ask that you would save the weakest amongst us. Strengthen us, O oh God. Save the laws and bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. The best is yet to come. By the way of introduction, this message is, I guess in some ways, but really it isn't a departure from our seek the Lord God first thing. Matter of fact, it's it slap dab in the middle of it, but I want to kind of uh, uh, explain how we got here. What occasioned this passage? What brought us to Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 10 was the question that the prophet Haggai asked to correct the improper perspective that many had of the temple rebuilding project. Um, I want to thank God for Evangelist Wilborn. She's been on the field preaching the gospel. Um, she's a, a real evangelist. Um, no stage is too large for her. No stage is too small. And that lady will go in places where grown men won't and preach the gospel. And the Lord has watched over and has kept her. And she will be ministering here Tuesday night. Say amen for her. But that was uh, the people... Um, did not, they had a, their perspective on the temple rebuilding project was wrong. Um, and and uh, they were disappointed. And they were disappointed when they really did not have a right to be. And it was the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles a time where the commemoration of the Lord bringing the children of Israel through the wilderness and a time of, of, to praise the Lord for a bountiful harvest was taking place. It was a multi-day celebration. And the people had come from all over because, you, you see, by now they had for at least 16 years been, been settled back into Jerusalem. They had been released. Uh, they had served their 70 years of bondage. 70, now 86 years prior, Jerusalem fell. They went through their 70 years of Babylonian captivity. And then the Medes and the Persians conquered Babylonia. Cyrus set them free. Zerubbabel and Joshua with some 42,000 plus left Babylon, went back up to Jerusalem, and began to rebuild the temple. They ran into resistance from the people. The people pulled all kinds of political maneuvers to block their progress, and eventually they stopped the temple rebuilding program. And the program was put on hold for 16 years. The Lord raised up an elderly prophet, an old man by the name of Haggai. And, uh, 
and he raised up uh, after Haggai uh, began to preach, God gave him a tag team partner by the name of Zechariah. And Haggai and Zechariah preached to the people. And when they preached to the people, the people began to rebuild the temple again. They explained why the crops wasn't growing. And the clothes, clothing would not warm them. And they, they explain why of when you eat, you won't get full. They explain why there were ecological uh, problems and the, the weather wouldn't participate. See, um, they explained that the weather phenomenons then, the causes then are the same causes for the weather phenomenons that we see today, and that is the sin of man. Disobedience is what's going on with the weather. I wonder why is it so cold one day and so hot the next. I wonder why it's not so cold all the time or very hot all the time, considering how wicked society is. I've just told you about where state after state are passing laws to abort fully developed babies. Now, the abortion crowd used to argue that it's just a clump of cells. Remember that? It's just tissue. It's not a person. Now, they've dropped that argument because technology shows you can't make that argument uh, in the third trimester. Child's about to be born. That is a fully developed human being. As I speak, fully developed human beings who are totally innocent. They've never broken one law. They've never disobeyed God. They've never committed any sin nor any crime. Fully developed human beings are being exterminated in this country. In the state of New York, uh, I think about 15%, Sister Sharon, I think I'm right, or so of the babies that are aborted there where is where the parents pay for them. The rest of it is at taxpayer expense. And the overwhelming majority of those babies that are being killed are kids that look like uh, us. There's a slaughter going on. And uh, across, in pulpits across America, preachers won't talk about it. There's going to be a lot of blood on the hands of preachers when they stand before the Lord. Because we know how the Lord feels about little children. And of all people, do you not know that to defend abortion, Hillary had the nerve to quote where Jesus said, suffer little children to come unto me. Now, he didn't mean it that way. He didn't mean it that way. We have redefined marriage in this country. We know how God feels about the institution of marriage. Amen. It is the, his second, first institution. First. First. Before he established the church and organized worship, before he, he established the institution of the family, he brought Eve to Adam and established marriage and Moses said for this cause shall a man born male leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife born female and they too shall be one flesh God did that God gave no politician permission to change that Preacher, why are you still talking uh, about that? It's, it's still changed, isn't it? And if we ever go back to getting it right, I'm going to preach about how we changed it. <laughs> Some things you can't let go. Because the Lord has not let go. We, we've gotten to the point now where during the family hour, they show movies and things with same-sex partners kissing each other 
and, and, and there's little Johnny and little Susie sitting there and the little children innately know that there's something wrong with that. Then you got to explain and if you have, if your brain is mush, then now you are beginning to say to your children what you've learned from talking heads on television who have a satanic agenda. You're telling your child, well, you know, some people just have a love for members of the same sex. And, and we don't judge them. And we don't, you know, we, we just accept people as they are. The little kid sitting there scratching his head. And by the time you finish abusing him with wicked ideology, the Bible speaks of doctrines of devils. You, when you start... Once you fill their head with that wicked stuff, it's child abuse. You have messed up your own child. And we wonder what's going on with, with, with the weather. Praise the Lord. The White House was decked out in homosexual colors. You don't want me to talk about that because Obama did it. But he did it. And then to celebrate passing the new law to kill more babies in New York, they lit up the tower. And the people applauded that law. Let me tell you something. We're blessed to have weather as good as what we have. And I believe that the mercy comes because of those saints who are living right. See, when the plagues came to Egypt, God protected the saints in Goshen. Hallelujah. Then when the Lord saw that he was going to send a plague that nothing will protect them from, he said, now put the blood over your doorposts. And when, when I see the blood, I'll take care, uh, I'll pass over you. Am I in the Bible? See, see the Bible speaks to current affairs. But you have to read it. So the people, let me get back to this. The people uh, stopped for 16 years. Zerubbabel and Joshua uh, stopped. They were stopped, but Haggai and Zechariah preached, and the people began to rebuild. Haggai explained the weather and why their money wouldn't grow. That was the point that I was making. Now, um, so they, they began to work, and they worked for about two to three weeks. But they had to stop the work for the feast of the tabernacle. Are you following me? So the people came from throughout Judah, from the countryside to see the progress on the temple, uh, see the progress that was made. And when they saw what had transpired, instead of the people being thankful for what God had blessed them to do, they began to murmur. They began to talk too much. Well, it's not as big as what Solomon did. Is that it? It's no, it, that's the temple? They haven't gotten any further than that? I don't see the gold that Solomon had. Solomon was the king. Solomon had his father David to raise the offering. You can tell David was church of God in Christ. Because Christopher, when he raised the offering, they counted it. It wasn't enough. Then he raised another offering. He went around again. That's in the Bible. And he was Kojic because he told the folk how much he gave. That's in the Bible. You just have to read it. So, uh, Solomon had professional builders. 
professional brick masons. Professionals. Zerubbabel was working with a group of exiles who had just been released from Babylonian captivity. So it was not a fair comparison. That's the point that I'm making. And when you throw in the fact that no matter how wonderful Solomon's temple was, there is no building that can contain the God of heaven. So Solomon's building was inadequate also. For Solomon said himself, the heavens of heavens cannot contain thee. Solomon said, I'll tell you what you would do. If you would just put your name here and let us pray in the direction of this building with your name here, then I believe that uh, everything will be all right. God answered him and said, what if I send, shut up heaven, that there be no rain, and send locusts to devour the land, and pestilence? He says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn, let me leave that part out. And turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven. Forgive the sin. And heal the land. What a mighty God. So even though Zerubbabel's temple was not as, it didn't have the opulence of Solomon's temple. It was not as grandiose as Solomon's temple which by the time Haggai said this, Solomon's temple had been burned for 86 years. Amen. Amen. If you want to study the grandeur of Solomon's temple, study 1 Kings chapter 6. And then the fall of Solomon's temple, study 2 Kings chapter 25. It was burned. The reason, another reason the comparisons were not proper is that it was the Lord's house. See, we don't judge God's house by which physical house is prettier than the other. The significance of the Lord's house is that it is the Lord's house, be it large or small, grand or tall. It's the Lord's house. The beauty of the Lord's house is that it's the Lord's house. Amen. I haven't seen anything yet that rivals the beauty of the temple, Church of God in Christ, where I got saved on Stewart Street back in Raleigh. I met Jesus in that place. For me, that will always be right there facing the altar, left-hand side. The steps were maybe two. And I got down on my knees on those steps, the podium to my right, left-hand side, and I met Jesus Christ. That's the prettiest place. That's the prettiest place. You can set that building in this building multiple times. Multiple it's still one of the grandest, prettiest places. I've been privileged to go quite a few places and to see a few beautiful things. But nothing as beautiful as where I was when I met Jesus. Because that's where Jesus met me. Are you following me? So they were wrong. And, and, and I got to move fast. Habakkuk asked the question in chapter 2, verse 3. Who is left among you? that saw this house in his first glory. Chapter 2 and verse 3. How do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? 
He says, when you look at what Solomon built versus what Zerubbabel is building, it doesn't compare. And, and bear with me, this, this comparison thing had already robbed them of joy that they should have had, Superintendent Brooks, you know this, being the scholar that you are, 16 years earlier, they had a temple foundation completion ceremony. They had completed the temple foundation. And when they came to celebrate, read it in Ezra chapter 3, 10 through 13, read it at your leisure. You could not determine the sound of the crowd. Because the elderly folk who remembered Solomon's temple thought that the foundation was too small. The young people who had never seen Solomon's temple, who were born in Babylonian captivity, celebrated the accomplishment. The elderly people were wrong. They were wrong. They should have celebrated the progress that was made. So when the sound went up, you, the Bible says, Ezra said, you can't tell whether the people were weeping or rejoicing. Now when it's time to praise God, you ought to be able to tell when the praise break out. Am I right about that? And there's something wrong when, you, when your praise sounds like a wailing. That's not supposed to be. Oh, that wailing. What's wrong with her? She's happy. That's not the way you express joy. The people couldn't tell. And as I said, I'm laying a foundation. They had that 16-year work stoppage shortly after that. And now that they've started back, here's this comparison thing again. Praise the Lord. The point is that many of them were living in the past, in the glory of the past. They were living nostalgically. You have to be careful with nostalgia because nostalgia causes you to romanticize yesteryear. And uh, the things that are too painful to remember in the past, in many cases, we just forget. So there is a romanti romanticization of the past. And you, and you hear it all the time. I said this Thursday night, which I'm, I'm explaining to you how I got to this passage here. Uh, people, those who, who've been saved a while, they will tell you that people don't get saved now like they used to. Because honey child, when we got saved back in the day, we really got saved. We got it like the Bible says. This salvation they're getting now, I don't know what that's all about. So you don't realize you're talking about God. See, who's offended by that is the Lord because Jesus saves. Amen. He's the one who sets free. And maybe when you got set free, you rolled on the floor. All right, the other person got set free. They stood and lifted their hands. But free is free. And to whom the Lord sets free. Makes free. They are free indeed. Do so I have anybody to, today who's free? So, you know, they were looking back on the past. Kind of reminds me of a, I told you this, of a, one of those commercials, them DNA commercials. I don't know why you all let these people just talk you into just giving them your DNA. They figured out a way to get you to give up your DNA. And you pay to give them your DNA. You don't know what they're doing with that DNA. 
24 and me. You don't know what they're doing with your, inf your private information. And I was watching two, a commercial that was two African-American twins. And the boy said, I wish I could go back a few hundred years to meet the people, my loved ones. And I said to myself, no, you don't. If you go back there, you're a slave. You go back to that time, you have no rights. No, thank God for then. And I praise the Lord for now. God knew what he was doing. But these people, they were in love with the past. The problem with this is that if the past isn't placed in its proper place, it can have devastating and lasting effects on our present and on our future. Hence our text uh, that we're preaching from today, Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely, wisely concerning this. The practice of living in the past can and will have a deleterious effect, a hindering effect on our lives. And I'm talking about past failures as well as past successes. We hear a lot about getting past the failures of our past. Past shortcomings. Past hurts. Past pains. Past abuses. These things are real. And they are debilitating. And people have been hurt bad in their past. But I want to say this to you. You can't let any tragedy, uh, any past tragedy, make a Tamar out of you. Tamar, David's daughter, Absalom and Abnon's sister, Abnon was no good, pretended to be sick, got his daddy or somebody to send his sister down to help him and to feed him, to help him get well. He rapes his sister. There's no, there's no question about that. You can't say she wanted it. He raped her. She begged him not to says, please do not this evil to me. But the man did it anyway. And then after raping her, he treated her with disdain. He dismissed her. He treated her as nothing. Ah, uh, she was decked out in a coat, a robe of many colors signifying her virginity. Her first sexual ex experience in life was something that tragic. First time she's ever had intimacy on that level was well, it was unwanted. You can, the, the, the psychiatrists who are here who do it for a living, they can tell you all the pains and the Things that happen as a result of abuse like that. And after he raped her and then began to treat her like a dog, she says, the way you've treated me after you've raped me is worse than the rape itself. Can I get a witness? And uh, it was a painful thing and she went home and uh, her brother Absalom saw it. And Absalom begged her and said, don't let this thing just stay on your mind. But she couldn't shake it. And the story of her life closes by saying, so Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. Desolate 
means totally broken, destroyed. I know that there are people in here today who have gone through some traumatic, traumatic experiences, but you can't let it break you. You can't allow it to make a Tamar of you. You've got to let the Lord give you strength to overcome. Oh, preacher, that's easier said than done. Yes, it's easier said than done. But it must be said. For if it is not said, then you will never try. And if you, if you don't try, then you will live in the shadow of that abuser for the rest of your days. And you shouldn't give anybody that kind of power over you. He may have raped you that day, but you ought not to let him rape you for the rest of your life. And the only way to keep it where it should be is that you got to get past it. And the Lord will help you. I must tell Jesus, Jesus will help me. Songwriter said, Jesus alone. She was uh, destroyed. Nor can you allow yourself to become an Ahithophel. You can read about uh, Tamar in 2 Samuel chapter 13. Uh, but uh, Ahithophel, his thirst for vengeance, his inability to deal with the past caused Ahithophel to end up committing suicide. Literally, he committed political suicide and literal suicide. You can read this in 2 Samuel chapter 17. In 2 Samuel, see you find, we find that uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 3 and in 2 Samuel chapter 23, you find out that this Ahithophel he was somebody. 2 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 12 tells us that Ohithophel was David's chief counselor. Amen. He was David's uh, pence. He was David's uh, vice president. He was his chief counselor. And uh, this chief counselor of David was also the grandfather of Bathsheba. Ahithophel's life was going good. This is why you got to be careful what you do because what you do affects other people. His life was going good until he, till David messed up Bathsheba's life. David should have been out there making war. It was the time for the kings to go to war. But David looked out. Uh, it was out of place and saw Bathsheba taking a bath. He sent for her and found out that she was the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Wife of Uriah the Hittite. That should have stopped them right there. Wife of. Should have stopped them right there. Praise the Lord. Wife of. Or wife. Since it wasn't his wife, why? I can't get a witness. Maybe it's too hot in Y'all cool them all so the saints to say amen. Amen. I, I feel like I'm preaching to a Presbyterian church. And my pastor used to say Presbyterian and two by four. You won't say amen. But uh, David, to cover up getting Bathsheba pregnant, David called uh, her husband Uriah off the battlefield and tried to get Uriah to go, go home and uh, be with his wife so that they can uh, put the baby on Uriah. So David was the baby daddy, but they were going to pin the baby on Uriah, but Uriah was too faithful to even enjoy his conjugal rights with his wife while his king David was at war. 
So when they tried to fool him, the man just wouldn't do it. Then David gets very dark. He orders to have Uriah killed. Uriah is killed. Oh, and David thinks he's gotten away. But, but, but Ahithophel, Bathsheba's grandfather, he, 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 he couldn't get past what David did. He was, he was David's chief counselor. Man, the things that they, they accomplished together. While David was king, Israel experienced its largest territorial expansion. The revivals and things that took place under King David had not happened heretofore. And uh, when King David did this, vengeance got in the heart of Ahithophel. And then David's son, Absalom, uh, began to feel some kind of way for his daddy because David did not avenge Tamar right. Yes, sir. And so Ahithophel began to plot against David by giving bad advice to Absalom. But now I'm going to say something to you that's going to really put you in a tailspin. David was wrong. David, what he did was wicked. What David did was inexcusable. But David was the Lord's anointed. Now that don't make what he did right. David prayed against the wisdom of Ahithophel. And Ahithophel's plan failed. And when Ahithophel saw that his plan had failed, Ahithophel hung himself. He went home and got his affairs in order, and he took his own life. Praise the Lord. What happened to him? In both cases here, their inability to deal with the tragedies of their past caused their past to do away with them. Saints, I know that there are people who have done you wrong. I know that, and they may, they may seem to be riding high. I know, praise the Lord, life is not always fair. But you got to know how to handle your past. Got to know how to get past, past things. Praise the Lord, because if you don't get past it, it will sooner or later uh, cause you to pass away before you become the person that God would have you to be. Can I preach just for a few more minutes? Amen. But not, not, not only uh, failures, but good things. Positive things. Past accomplishments can have a deleterious Affect on our lives as well. I'm not getting any amens now. These things can cause us to become too comfortable. Too settled. Too undisturbed. Too satisfied. A string of victories has a sedating effect. Uh, we begin to feel... We, we begin to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. I heard Jeremiah 48 and 11 says, Moab has been at ease from his youth. He hath settled on his lees and have not been emptied from vessel to vessel. The phrase settled on your lees, uh, is a, the metaphor is that of a bottle of wine. And the lees are the dregs that drift down to the bottom if the wine sets still too long. To use it from, as a metaphor, it is resting too long on your past accomplishments. Yes, there's a whole lot of us. We are wonderful because of what we did in college. We're wonderful because of what we did five years ago. 
We're, we're, we're the greatest. If you don't believe me, ask us. We, we've lost our yearning for the Lord because we did some things uh, some time ago. The prophet Zephaniah said in Zephaniah 1 and 12, I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the man who have settled on his leaves. God knows how to shake us up. God knows how to say, thank God for your past accomplishments, but don't let it rob you of your prayer life. Don't let past achievements rob you of your drive for the Lord. Hallelujah. When we live in the past, when we live in the past and when we constantly hop on the good old days and how they were so much better than now, it causes us to live in a world of unreality. Some of us live in a world of our own making. And when you live in that world of unreality, praise the Lord, over much dwelling on the past can prevent us from overcoming the world. You see, amen, we have a devil to face today. The Bible says sufficient, sufficient for today is the evil thereof. And we got to deal with today. And may, let God make us ready for tomorrow. I like what Paul said about his past. And, and contextually, Paul wasn't talking about past failures. He was talking about his past achievements. He said, if any man has a reason to glory in the flesh, I have a greater reason. He said, I was circumcised the eighth day. Good God Almighty, hallelujah, circumcised the eighth day. And, and he says, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. And uh, of the tribe, excuse me, the tribe of Benjamin. Yes, I was somebody. And he says, touching the law, I was a Pharisee. Mm -hmm. And concerning zeal, he said, I persecuted the church. And concerning the righteousness of the law, he said, I was blameless. Look at these impressive credentials. What a resume. His resume read that he got it all right that he was a bad man but Paul understood that that was yesterday mm, he understood that that was his past and he found out that something greater had come along Jesus said oh Lord Solomon in all of his glory talked about Solomon and his glory and what Solomon wore but then he pointed at himself and said a greater than Solomon is here Paul said my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved he said I bear them record that they have a zeal of God but it's not according to knowledge it's not according to what God is doing right now he said they're ignorant of God's righteousness and they set out to, uh, to, to establish their own righteousness and have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. I want to say to you today that whatever's in your past, be it good or bad, don't let it slow you down in your seeking the Lord. Whatever has happened, you can't do anything about it. You can't change it. Why are you still ashamed? Why are you still thinking that everybody is thinking about it? You can't change a thing, but uh, you can live and get better. Yeah! Yes, I'm glad that God has given us, given us a future. Paul said, here's what I do with the past. I put it in the right place. He said, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, I'm forgetting 
those things that are behind me and I'm reaching for the things that are before me. You got to learn how to put it all behind you. You got to learn how to let it all go and say to the Lord, here I am. Yes, Lord. Somebody shout, let it go. Ah, let it go. Don't let it hold you down. Don't let it hold you back. So what the dad left? So what that mom was drunk? So what that your family was dysfunctional? I don't know of anybody's family that wasn't. Every family have fallen short of the glory of God. Hallelujah. Don't let your accomplishments go to your head and you're sitting there acting like you don't need Jesus. Don't you let the devil fool you. Every one of us needs another touch. Every one of us needs the Lord. Yeah! Yeah, Lord! Somebody lift your hands and praise him like you've shaken off the past. Praise him! Ah, praise him! Thank you, Jesus. Paul said, in my clothes, in my clothes, and Paul said, I'm forgetting about those things that are behind me. To forget about doesn't mean to obliterate it from memory, but to just put it in a place where even though you know it happened, even though you remember what happened, you remember when it happened, you're not confused like the governor is. You know what happened and you know when, but you put it in a place where it doesn't affect you anymore. You just put it in a place where you won't let it slow you down. Do I have anybody here who's had some things that happen to you? You've been through a few things, but you've risen up anyhow. You got up anyhow. You decided that you would be somebody regardless to what happened in your past. If you've overcome, if you've overcome, if you put it behind you, if you're reaching for what is before you, I want you to give the Lord a praise right here. Tell him thank you. Tell him thank you. said I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God that is in Christ Jesus what was he pressing for he was pressing for that best that's yet to come I want to tell you that the Lord's not through with you I want to tell you that God has plans for you don't look back and say last year, year before last, the last decade was my good old days because the Lord has better days to come. The Lord has higher heights and deeper depths. Grab somebody by the hand and say, neighbor, these are the good old days. I'm living my good old days. Yeah! Yeah, Lord! Oh! Oh, Jesus! Woo! Do I have anybody in here who can say, I don't believe I preached my best message. I don't believe that I've lived my best life. I don't believe I'm where I'm headed. I don't believe I've hit the ceiling yet, but I believe that the best is yet to come. You got 
to keep looking forward. You got to keep moving forward. Forward. Yeah, Lord. Shake somebody's hand and tell them, I'm on my way. I'm on my way. Oh, I'm on my way to what the Lord has for me. I'm on my way to better. Better. Oh, yeah. Tell the devil, you can't block me. You can't stop me. Get out of my head. I don't believe him. I don't believe him. I don't believe him. I do not believe him. When he says wooden, God has no more for you. I don't believe you. Wooden, you've been as effective as you're going to be. I don't believe him. Wooden, when you were at 2901, those were the glory days. I ain't buying. Wooden, back at Lake Willow Road or in Canada, those were your high moments. Loose hair. Yeah. I ain't buying. Don't you buy that stuff. Said to the saints the other day, hair guy was an old man. See, sometimes the mothers and the fathers can feel retired before God retires you. But hair guy was an old man when the Lord called him. In his, he had to at least, if he saw the temple, if he saw it, and theologians argue that he did, if he saw the temple, he had to at least be 70. And if he was standing there preaching after they had gone through the exile, come out of the exile, and 16 year work stoppage, now that means he has to be at least 86 when he started his ministry. And at, and at 86, see, at 86, God moved on him with something that would be so powerful that he would make scripture. He would end up in the Bible. And mother, he didn't preach for three months. And after three months, that's the end of him. God did a work in that man that Put him in the canon of scripture. Isn't that amazing? At least 86. Probably older than that. And they believe that perhaps uh, because you don't get much more uh, writings from him. It is believed that he possibly passed away. But when he was in Babylonian captivity. The Lord told him, I know the thoughts. That I think towards you. Hey, hey, guy, while he's toiling, best is yet to come. They left Jerusalem. They left Babylonia, walking back to Jerusalem. Old man now, at least 70. A thousand to a thousand six, six, six hundred miles or so. Trek back down, back up to Jerusalem. God whispers again, best is yet to come. They began to build the temple. They dedicate the foundation. Is this it? The Lord whispers again, the best is yet to come. The enemy stops the progress. One year, five, ten years. Is that it? God whispers, the best is yet to come. 
16 years later, the Holy Ghost moves on him and say, go tell Zerubbabel, tell the governor, tell the priests, and tell the people why they're working and can't make any money. Why they put on clothes and they won't get warm. Why they look for much, but it comes to little. Tell them. I'm an old man. Do what I've told you. I told you the best is yet to come. And after he preached and did the will of God, then the Lord told him again, the best is yet to come. And our, he closed his eyes, then Paul began to write, and the trump of God shall sound. And the dead in Christ, that's where Haggai is, shall rise first, best. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up with them to meet the Lord in the middle of the air. The best is yet to come. See, when you are a believer, Celia, when you are a believer, the best is always. God's with you now. Yet to come in Jesus' name. I need about 10 or 15 worshipers to just begin to worship the Lord if you believe that for your life, the best is yet to come. The best yet to come. Do you believe it? Appreciate the past. Thank God for it. Be grateful. But, I, you know, I was determined, and I'm, I'm getting ready to pray. I was determined to be, not to be one of those people whose glory days were high school. Many of my colleagues that I came up with, their glory days was winning the state championship football game in high school. I was determined that I wasn't going to be one of those people who would say my collegiate years were the best years of my life. Wouldn't it be bad? You're 70 years old and your best years were when you were in college. What? Mm -mm. Every day with Jesus. Get sweeter than the day before. Somebody lift their hands and just give him praises. I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad. I'm glad. Pray for me, Pastor. I've been trapped past things have played too great a role in my life, and it has had a deleterious effect. It has, it has hindered me, and I can't let it go from being a hindrance to destroying me. Oh my. The woman suffers who marries the man whose first wife mistreated him. The man suffers who marries the woman whose first husband didn't do her right. If she don't handle the past right, She's fighting ghosts. The person who has had cancer doesn't handle right properly finding a strange bump or something on their bodies because the 
First thing the devil says, is, it's bad. So you got to, you got to put that, you got to handle that healing right. You, you, the Lord brought me out. And, oh, you don't hear me. Praise the Lord. You tried, you started that business and you failed. And you failed hard and you lost everything. And the devil have you scared to try again. You have to put that failure. You won't ever forget it, but you got to put it in a place where it doesn't keep you from trying again. You can't let it happen. My past, be it failures or successes, need to be dealt with. Help me, preacher, so I can believe that my better days lie ahead. If I'm talking to you, come quickly. It's mine to be perfect. It's my aim to be true. So I gave my heart to Jesus, that's all I know to do. Maybe you saw me when I fell to my knees. Oh, but I got up with a made up mind. Well, I'm not what I'm going to be, but I'm better than I used to be. I'm getting better all the time. I'm getting better all the time. I'm getting better all the time. I'm getting better since I've learned to lean on him. He gives me peace of mind. Getting better all the time. Y'all just watch my life. Well, I'm not what I'm gonna be, but I'm better than I used to be. I'm getting better all the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm getting better all the time. I'm getting better all the time. time, time. Oh, Lord. On the altar, lift your hand. Lift your hands on the altar. Every one of us, you're the ones on the altar. But whether you know it or not, you stand in proxy for everybody. Because people, life, Johnson, has to be lived. And life has blows. Things happen to you. Praise the Lord. Tragedies happen. Abuses happen. And do you know you can't put as much time in why did it happen as much as 
Now how do I deal with this? How do I get past this? What do I make of this? See, because see, Lord, I know it wasn't designed to kill me because I'm here. Huh? I know, I know it wasn't designed to take me out because you didn't let it. So then that means I got to live with it. But you always cause us to triumph. So that means I've got to triumph in it and beyond it. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take it right now while we're on the altar. You who are on Facebook Live, join me. Join me today. Take it, take it, take it, take it. And put it in your mind. Put it in a place. Put it on the shelf in that corner that says I'm through with you. Yes, you happened. Yes, I experienced it. But I will not live in your shadow any longer. But you will live in mine. You will live in my dust. Because you're going to see me go on from here and be the person that the God of the Bible would have me be. In the name of Jesus, Father, we come to the altar. We bring our past. We bring every hurt. And we bring every accomplishment. We bring everything that would rob us of our zeal that would rob us of our joy, that would rob us of our excitement for you. We bring it to you today. We put it on that shelf. We turn our back on it, and we're going to walk away. No more nightmares. Loose here. No more sleepless nights. Not because of this. Forgive your daddy. Forgive your mama. Forgive that person. Let it go. Let the thirst for vengeance go. Don't be an Ahithophel. And don't you be a Tamar. Don't you be scarred for the rest of your days. Good God Almighty, the Lord told me to tell you that I have victory for you. I have victory for you. I have an open door. I have an open door. Ways are being made. Doors are being opened. The glory is coming down right here and now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Jesus, we declare that the best is yet to come. And we're going to leave here and walk in the best. We're going to leave here and strive to get higher, to go higher in you. We're going to seek you as never before. We're going to call on your name because you are the God, the God that healeth, the God that delivereth, and the God who sets free. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Satan, you are a liar. I will not be defined. I will not be bound. I will not be enslaved to yesterday's hurts, yesterday's wounds, yesterday's achievements, yesterday's accomplishments. But I will climb higher in the Lord. I will be all that he'd have me to be. Hey. Hey Lord, yes Lord, yes Lord, yes Lord, somebody's getting it, yes Lord, I'm coming up, I'm coming up, I confess that I messed up, I confess that I dropped the ball, I confess, oh Lord, that I fell short, but I thank you, I thank you, I thank you, for power to rise above it all. I thank you for power to get up from here, for power to be that man and to be that woman you'd have me to be. Hallelujah. So I pray.
praise the Lord in the devil's face. I dance on the devil's neck. I wave my hands. I thank the Lord for my victory. I thank the Lord for what the Lord has done for me. Oh, yeah. Praise him, praise him, praise him. Praise him, praise him, praise him. Praise him, praise him, praise him. Praise him, praise him, praise him.